Welcome to another episode of the Carry Trainer Higher Line Podcast. Welcome to another episode of the Higher Line Podcast. As always, these podcasts are brought to you by Gunfighter Gun Oil, which you can get at gunfighteroil.com, as well as cleaner and grease and t-shirts and things of that nature. This episode, I think, is very timely. We've got our friend Patrick Keneally, elected state's attorney, out here to discuss things like police reform, talk about things like bail reform, and whether or not our judicial system in our country needs to be completely revamped. People on his end would argue it is the highest law enforcement office in the That's county. Right. The sheriff, on the other hand, would say no, his Far is. Away. But you are the elected state's attorney. Yes, sir. What's the state's attorney? A state's attorney is responsible for prosecuting um, everybody generally that's charged with a crime in McHenry County. So you represent the people against criminals? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so we prosecute on behalf of the people. So the government has a monopoly on force. As a result of that, you need somebody that's going to find people, or I should say prosecute people, and attempt to prove them either guilty beyond a reasonable doubt or not, and make the kinds of decisions with respect to charging and otherwise that uh, is done on behalf of the good citizens of McHenry County. Same as a district attorney in other states? Yeah, so it just depends on how your state um, organizes its state. If mm -hmm. it's a state that organizes it by county, you call it a state's attorney. If it's a state that organizes by district, generally you'll call it a district attorney. Are those elected offices too, yeah. usually? Yeah, yeah. usually okay. all of them. Usually okay. all of them. And they have to be because you are literally standing as a proxy or in the person of the people and acting on their behalf. So your job is... Uh, somebody does something bad in the community. Your job is to represent me and the other people of our county. The community. On, on our behalf, going to this person or people that committed a crime saying, here's what we're going right. to try good, to do to you. Right, and there's a good reason for that because crime doesn't just affect victims. It doesn't just affect the person that's committed the crime. It affects an entire community in all kinds of important ways and all kinds of ways that have these sort of cascading and rippling effects mm -hmm. throughout a community. You were a prosecutor before you were the elected state's attorney. You practiced law, too, on, on your yep. own before that. Mm -hmm. uh, prosecutor, people that work in your office now doing the things you're talking about. You did murder cases and drug yep. cases and mm -hmm. all kinds of stuff like yep. that. All the bad stuff. Mm -hmm. Some of the things we want to talk about, which I know you are passionate about, is the reform reform going on, the re branding of what policing should be in America. And you and the cops are dovetailed together. They go catch the bad guys, say, here's what we found him doing, yeah. here's the evidence, and then your office presents that evidence to, to the state, right? Yeah, we work closely with police. And um, what I've found is that for the most part, uh, especially in McHenry County, is we have a wonderful police force and a police force that many of us should be thankful for. Uh, have there been instances of misconduct? Absolutely. Um, in any type of system that you're attempting to set up, especially if that system involves fallible human beings, um, there's going to be imperfections. Mm -hmm. um, but what I have found is that the criminal justice system as a whole and as it is currently constituted is well equipped to absorb those types of misconduct and hold the people accountable. So I think here's a disconnect. Like, absorb but is somebody getting pissed on in that absorption process you know like if there's some issue with a human being fallible like the problems absorb but isn't there somebody who's getting their toes stepped on or what i mean by absorb is that the criminal justice system is perfectly capable of um handling and dealing with fairly many of the instances of police misconduct that gotcha. a lot of people are pointing to as evidence of why we need these broad sale I gotcha. systemic you're, changes. You're saying the system as a whole right now already has mechanisms in place to yeah. deal with it. And this. I think Derek Chauvin is the perfect example of that. I think there's a number of examples of police officers all across the country that are being prosecuted for misconduct. Police misconduct to me is an incredibly serious issue because as we talked about before, police have a monopoly on force in this society. You can't commit force unless you're doing it in self-defense. I can't commit force unless I'm doing it in self-defense. Police are the ones that are acting and using force on our behalf. Therefore, as a result of that, there's an incredible opportunity for them to abuse their power, mm -hmm. um, especially when they're the ones that are writing the police reports and they're the ones that, to a certain extent, are recording the history of what happened. And that's a very dangerous position 
And those types of abuses of power are not met with a sense of humor by people like me. Um, and um, they're certainly taking incredibly serious. And that's certainly a factor in aggravation when you're talking about what a police officer should be sentenced to. What I found, however, is that for the most part, police officers do an extraordinary good job of not only self-policing themselves, but also showing restraint in terms of the power that they exercise and being conscious and mindful of that mm -hmm. in the execution of their duties. Mm -hmm. you, you and I've talked quite a bit about, like in our state of Illinois, this new reform that is very much exposing law enforcement to much greater liability out doing their job. What do you think about that? I think it's, I think it's uh, wrong. So what's going on in Illinois right now is that the, um, I think probably the, a group of people who are left of center um, and maybe even left of center left um, have sort of taken the reins with respect to this whole idea of criminal justice reform. And everybody is now convinced that we need criminal justice reform. And it's just strange that 20 years ago, everybody thought that the criminal justice system wasn't punishing severely enough. And so now it just is, there's this new topic and these new ideas and narratives out there that everybody just seems to embrace. And um, there's a number of buzzwords that are out there that haven't been sufficiently defined that nobody quite understands, but everybody's down on the criminal justice system. Give me I, a buzzword you're talking about. Systemic uh, racism. Okay. All right. Um, and um, so, the, you know, so the, those types of things haven't been clearly defined and I don't think they've been adequate. I don't think that the arguments in favor of them are sufficiently convincing, but the, you have a group of people that just accept it on faith and then just use that and roll right by you. Um, and so as a result of that, we're getting a number of reforms that just aren't really balanced. And it's really the worst kind of reforms because there's a party that has a super majority in Illinois, not only in the House, but also in the Senate, mm -hmm. that is getting exactly what it wants. Exactly what it wants because there is no ability of the opposition to influence it, slow it down in any way. Mm -hmm. And to me, when one side is getting exactly what it wants, um, that's the very worst type of legislation. When once, when there is no comprom, when there is, when there's, there's not even um, minor compromises in terms of language, in terms of ideas, um, in terms of how it's going to be executed. I mean, that's the, 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 that therein is is the exact type of legislation that I think in a society like ours is going to cause more problems than it. That it that's, helps. That's why our founders created a republic and not a democracy, right. because of that. I right. was just reading Sam Adams' a writing of his last night, and he was talking about factions is what he was calling yeah. it. Factions in government getting so entrenched that then you get like we've had here, what we've had here in Illinois for decades where these factions that have certain ways of viewing the world and certain ways of thinking, that's what you get. And there's really no way to change it because the structure of government makes it so impossible to change the power that those those factions or groups have. Yeah, and th not just that, but especially in today's political climate, when everybody is so spun up, mm -hmm. you know, and everybody is, and all of the speech is so um, inflammatory mm -hmm. and hyperbolic and where it's all, a, a, it's, it's all about winning and it's all about, and there's so much, uh, incrimination and recrimination of the other side and not just them and their positions, but also their motives and who they are. I think that you get a lot of legislation that for lack of a better word can be somewhat vindictive. And I think that the police, um, are suffering from that, um, right now. So for example, there's, they just passed legislation where, um, a, um, police officer, when they have body cameras, they're not allowed to look at their body cameras before they're, before they write their reports. Okay. So then if they go back and then they find any discrepancies between the body cameras and the police report, they've also made it a law where if you misreport things, or if you're putting false information in a police report, that's a class three felony. OK, now let's just think about this from a so th that seems unfair, you know what I mean, especially when we're asking, especially when we know that domains of memory and learning and things like sure. that are impaired in these types of stressful situations. Not to mention that <laughs> camera is seeing something different than here. Exactly. Yeah. Not to mention the fact that the camera is one perspective and your and it's consciousness a lens. is a completely di different kettle of fish. For Science Institute, right. Bill Lewinsky did 
that has done tons of studies right. on that. Yeah. Yeah. So so now so you you and I and Drew all in this room have a complete different perception of what's happening in here right now. Exactly. Just, okay. Totally agreed. And we're bringing mm -hmm. everything that's happened to us and our experience and our perspective mm -hmm. um, and um, we're bringing who we are to all of these events. You know what I mean? And you're probably very nervous and intimidated talking to me. So you're probably, you know what I mean? So like I feel, so I'm trying to, <laughs> I'm trying to dumb things down for you a little bit, but no, I'm only kidding. I'm only kidding. I'm only kidding. Hey, you're an idiot. Um, but um, so anyway, so that, those are all those things. And, and the, and so the idea that, you can then charge a police officer with or felonize them. It's not only seems unfair and wrongheaded, but it has the practical effect, which is who the hell wants to do that job? And of course, in a situation where somebody's analyzing in great depth this footage, it was probably something where there was something with jeopardy involved, where the officer or yeah, the suspect, because sure. they're not doing this for nothing incidents handing off paperwork right so we we're going to assume this person's adrenalized in a heightened state of, of, a, of alertness and awareness etc but even not it also comes to interpretation so like if even if it's just like a standard type of arrest where an officer is assisting and he's writing a report and there's um, some there's something that he's omitted from his uh, narrative by virtue of the fact that he, you know what I mean, by just, just by virtue of the fact that he's summarizing what had happened, somebody could take that omission and say, hey, that's a intentional omission. And as a result of that, you're, we're going to jeopardize your life and liberty um, when you were acting in good faith or, my God, even you made a mistake, you know, so... Um, and there's no human that's infallible, especially when no. it comes to data gathering and recollection. And when doing all of this ministerial work, you know, you got five police reports to write before the end of your shift. You got to get through it because you got to get home because the boys got baseball practice or the girls got um, to go to basketball practice or mm -hmm. whatever the case may be. Um, and um, so it it's just puts police officers in almost an impossible position where... Um, you just begin to wonder if some of this stuff is intentional in order really to categorically change the nature of policing and um, to change the nature of the type of people that generally are um, feel called to this line of work, mm -hmm. you know, because traditionally and like I'm trying to you, you, you try to like think about it. You try to try to figure out like what is going on here and why? Like, let, let's get but like traditionally much like um uh, let's say school boards or school unions have been um, populated by people who are, let's say, center left. People in police departments is generally considered sort of a bastion of conservative thought. And so you wonder if that has something to do with a lot of the intent and pressure that are being brought to bear on police departments right now and the idea of injecting them with people who, who may have a political ideology that is more in line with those who are in power, such as social workers. Now, I'm not saying that so, it's not a good idea to have social workers, it's not a good idea to have people who are responsive to those on the street who are having mental health problems and all the rest of it, but it just seems that that's part, at least underlying, some of what is, is going on. We definitely ask too much of law enforcement. Just, so you brought up social worker. Law enforcement has nothing to do with social work but we ask these people to go out and take care of mental health issues and, and uh, uh, health concerns mm -hmm. until paramedics or, or uh, firefighters arrive. They're tasked with, in every community, tasked with so many things from traffic stuff to crime yeah. to my kid won't eat his cereal and go to school. To evidence, you gotta be able to, you have, yeah. you have to be an evidence technician mm -hmm. or a technology, you know, you have to have expertise in technology when it mm -hmm. comes to like, like we were just talking about, like some of the location services and then subpoenas and then the training. And people keep saying like, oh, well, police officers just need more training and de-escalation and all. Half of the police officer's time is spent in training. Like every single time you call up to a police department, you're trying to get a hold of somebody. Oh, they're gone and they're at um, training. But when it comes to like the whole use of force thing, um, it, you're, I agree with you 100 percent is that we're asking far too much of police officers because what we're essentially asking them to do is to make the use of force look pretty. 
you know, so, and make it look camera ready and make it look good fundamentally on camera. And that's an impossible thing That's a good way to, to articulate do, it. Make know? it look pretty like, hey, I need you to deal with this person that's trying to hurt you. But do it nice just so look, that it looks good so that we'll, exactly. we roll tape later. And like if you think of like just like, okay, like just just my hands. Like how hard do you think if I was hell bent on resisting both of you guys, okay? Think about just how hard it would be just to control my hands. Sure. Like seriously. I was wrestling with you last night. You're a strong man. <laughs> exactly. Just like just a good, but not just control them, but immobilize them permanently. Sure. So not just like control them for 30 seconds, but immobile and I'm hell bent. Okay. Now imagine that you're a female, okay, and uh, you're I do all the two. Time. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> now imagine that your alter ego has come out. Okay, Sarah's here. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> exactly. Uh, keep right. going. All right, but now imagine that you're okay, okay. and so, you're dealing so with me, I'm and I'm like thirty two hundred. So you're officer. like you're two thirds as the size, and you're two thirds as strong as you are. Okay. Half. Half, all right, and you're try and I'm 210 pounds, and I'm still hell bent on reason. Now imagine how hard that just to control my hands, okay? Now imagine that I'm not 42, I'm 22 years old, and I'm even bigger than I am, okay? Now imagine how hard it would be to control my hands. Now imagine that I'm mentally ill, okay, and I'm trying to commit suicide by cop. And you're not taking uh, any logical. I'm not making thought that, I, like you can't reason with mm -hmm. me. You, like you, there's there's no reasoning with me, all right? Or I'm high, or or something else. Um, and like, there's no magical series of like moves, you know what I mean? Where you're going to be able to restrain me, sure. you and five other people with, it doesn't matter how much training you have. If Here's you go, what we get often, Mickey, you should be teaching these officers to shoot them in the legs and arms. Th there's so many, I mean, go on YouTube and there's so many tapes of people being shot in the chest and the arms and the legs and they're still coming, Yeah, you know? Um, not to not to mention if we use deadly force with a firearm, right. it's because there is a measure of force back at us that it's commensurate. You. And not to mention the fact that it's not easy to hit somebody in the arm mm -hmm. or the legs, especially if it's a moving target. And then as soon as you, then the last thing you want is shots missing, ricocheting, and mm -hmm. going who knows where when you have other police officers or the public around. I mm -hmm. mean, well, so let's mm -hmm. just talk about that from that perspective. Use of force, if if that kind of force is required. I need to stop you. The right. exigency of the circumstances is such that I must stop you, but I need to stop you. Yeah. And not to mention, if I shoot you in the leg, you have a femoral artery or a brachial artery yeah. here. Now I've just get, put you in a situation and where- And it explodes. It's the, all the kinetic <laughs> energy. It's like, you know what I mean? Now, now like we create a situation where yeah. we've got somebody just bleeding to death and, it, and not stopping whatever violence is happening. Yeah. There clearly is situations where training, when we just said that officer use a, ta a firearm in place of a taser, and it's well studied by law enforcement trainers. Tasers are carried in a different location so that we don't have a, a capture error and grab the wrong tool. You saw this footage. Yep. I mean, that, and that's tragic and it's horrible. That's a training issue. And that person was the training officer for their department, had many years on, on the department. That's the the infallibility you're talking about. We are humans. Yeah, and it's, I mean, when you're talking, and p police are being asked to um, go out and confront citizens in the most heavily armed society in the world, mm -hmm. you know? Um, and um, every single encounter, now I don't mean to sound paranoid, but every single encounter is potentially lethal sure and so they, it just really under and you have to understand police have a firearm on their waist and a taser over here so if you tase an officer and you immobilize them then the person has access to a firearm so if a, a police officer is tased incapacitated rendered unconscious or otherwise that now creates a deadly threat to everyone around that mm -hmm. police officer that they're trying to help and that they're trying to save um and so, that, so th that's one of the reasons why I think a lot of people don't understand why police officers do not um, oftentimes have to control a situation first before they start asking questions and before they start um, necessarily trying to, let's say, 
um, minister to the person who may be having a difficult time. So that person first needs to be controlled, and then we can begin the process of trying to figure out what's wrong, because the longer you let those types of chaotic situations go on, the worse it can be, and police officers do not and cannot have a sense of humor about the fact that that person poses a threat to them, because again, if they're overpowered, there's a gun in play. Every single time, 100% of the time. Mm -hmm. Maybe we need less guns in the world. No, I don't necessarily, I disagree. I don't necessarily think that's the answer. I was hoping you were going to say that. <laughs> I don't necessarily think that that's uh, the answer either. But th then you also look at like, okay, so, so like how, how many police shootings are there in a year? So in 2020, there was about a um, thousand police officers nationwide. involved nationwide. Okay. And then, but then you also have to think about, okay, well, how many like police interactions were there? Right. Millions. So, fi over 50 million. All right. How many arrests were there? So these are the types of situations where the police have to essentially use force, go hands on to actually take a person into custody and arrest them. So 50 million interactions. Fit, those are just the interactions. Yeah. Traffic, traffic stop. 10 million arrests. 10 million in the, arrests. In the United States. Okay. 1,000 officer. 1,000 officer involved shootings. Okay. Which is a fraction, fraction of 1%. Now, how many of those people were unarmed? All right. You're talking about there was about the, what the what the Washington Post says is that there was 14 unarmed African American men and about 25 unarmed white people who were killed who were unarmed. But they're Time not out. necessarily unarmed. I want to hear this. I want to make sure I hear this. So in 2020 was yeah. that? So 2020. Um, let's do the math on that. Uh, 10 million, 1,000. What's the actual percent? I don't know. Point if, like zero said, fraction fraction point zero fraction zero zero zero. Yeah, it, it's it's a fractional percentage uh, of the whole. Fourteen black unarmed males and twenty four or twenty five. Twenty five. Twenty five white unarmed males. And unarmed doesn't mean not dangerous. Sure. But so we'll unarmed just, means you have a car. One of the a few of the unarmed cases, you have a car and you're trying to ram. We're the just citing officer. the news source. Citing the news source. So twenty five white unarmed, fourteen black mm -hmm. unarmed which they probably were saying no knife or firearm. Right. But a bludgeon, a tennis racket, a, a fireplace poker, right. a vehicle is a mm -hmm. horrible weapon, which is probably the vehicle in most of the situations. Yeah, and, and, so, and so when you're looking at some of these cases, like you're looking at the Derek Chauvin case, you know what I mean? Or you're looking at some of the other cases. There was the case in, I think it was North Carolina, where there was the, um, there was the, the, the police officer had confronted somebody. He was running away, and the police officer shot him in the back when he's running away. Like, that's wrong. Sure. Okay? And that's murder. All right? And those people should be held accountable, and they are being held mm -hmm accountable is one of the points that I'd, I'd like to make. I mean, for the most part, nearly every single one of these police shootings, at least over the last few years, there has been some type of criminal response to it, and at the very least, some type of civil response. So it's, it's, but, the, but the broader point I'm trying to make is that each one of these cases needs to be looked at on an individual case-by-case -case basis to see if the misconduct of the police officer, if there even was there misconduct, was, yes. number one, and then if the misconduct of the police officer arose to the level of a criminal offense, sure. of, which is either recklessness or knowingly or intentional killing of somebody when they were not a deadly threat to them or other people, they all need to be looked at on a case-by-case -case basis, and I'm certainly not saying that there aren't instances where a police officer may maliciously, cruelly, recklessly hurt or kill somebody. Mm -hmm. Like, there clearly are, but my point is, they are infinitesimally rare in, when you compare it to all of the police interactions that you have. Therein lies the problem. We look at a number of a thousand, and we go, a thousand people killed by the police. No, no. 950-some-odd people stopped in an act of violence by police <laughs> like like just by a simple change of narrative yeah. but we look at that i was just in um salt lake city and they had a building uh and i'm not a police apologist i don't think every cop's a, a god like you're saying many of you are though <laughs> i'm just kidding but they had a building covered in many of them criminals these be beautiful portraits of people that were slain by police, but many of them were criminals killed in the act of a crime while de deciding not to give up and get put under arrest. But it was this building covered in murals and were worshiping these people as if they're somehow martyrs 
because they're criminals that it's just, it's insane. Yeah, which is the wonderful thing about our criminal justice system, which is every life has equal value. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Agreed. Like, so whether or not you want to turn certain, and there are people who happen to be criminals who are also victims. Like, you can be both. You know what I mean? Like, you can be both. All right. George Floyd uh, may have been using drugs and may have passed a counterfeit bill. He may, but he was also a victim of murder. Sure. And he deserves sympathy for that. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, and and how you how that culturally comes out and what type of recognition that I mean that's a different conversation from the from the the broader question, which is do people need to go? Or, is it really fair to go around on the news media or Twitter or otherwise and say things like? Um, police officers are hunting certain sections of the population or that it, is it rational for people to say, I, ha I, I fear getting shot and getting killed by the police when anybody in this country, irrespective of whatever demographic you may be in, whatever your race, whatever your ethnicity is, your chance of being killed by a police officer, it doesn't matter where you come from or who you are, is far, far less than getting struck by lightning. You know, and then that makes you think about the whole system. I rest my case, Your Honor, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen of the jury. And so, and so the point is, okay, so we have these events. So now it's like, okay, well, what do we do? Is that an accurate number? Is, am I more likely to be struck by lightning? Yes. Have yes. you done the numbers on a calculator? I mean, I have not personally <laughs> have done you it. spoke to a lightning expert? <laughs> right, exactly. <laughs> but yeah. Where is the lightning expert? <laughs> but yeah, you just run the numbers and you can do it. And if I'm wrong... Edit it out for the love of God. All right? <laughs> He's joking, but um, um, but it's it's true, and so and and that and you know that that's that I think that is so. So now we have these events that are horrible and visceral and lurid, and we see them, and they get into the cultural bloodstream. You know what I mean? And you just and they're wrong. I like, gotta add something. We're yeah. not laughing or making light of any type of of death. No. But, but Pat's point is that because it is so statistically implausible, you must not look at it as if it's some cultural norm. Right. right? And then how do we fix? So then, then the question is, okay, how do we fix this exception? You know, which we see and which we can um, empathize with. Mm -hmm. You know, like nobody could watch that George Floyd video and not be like, oh my god, that poor that 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 is that is horrific. Mm -hmm. Like that is horrific what happened to that guy. Um, and um, nobody can't help but have a, an emotional response to that and an enormous amount of sympathy, not only for George Floyd, but also for his family, mm -hmm. you know? I mean, I remember I went home and my wife was in tears having watched the video. Um, and so, um, so, th so what do we do about those situations? And then the question is, are those situations an ex is something that we try to limit as much as we possibly can, or do we make these broad sweeping changes in order to, um, so, or do we make these broad global systemic type of changes Based on in order feelings. to legislate, in, but in order to legislate these small, very rare instances? And I don't, I, I don't, I, that's a question that I struggle with. It is tough. Of course, if it was our family member or our, our loved one that was, erroneously killed then to us yeah, yeah bring my right sister back or my son back or my brother back of course there's yeah. nothing you wouldn't do mm -hmm. if it was your daughter or your son mm -hmm. or what or um whatever the case may be but then we also have to consider the fact that when we are now making these broad systemic changes and when police to a certain extent have been vilified that also has consequences yeah. in terms of blood on the there's streets a price to pay. and in terms of um, the, 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 the rates of crime, the rates of murder. Um, and that's especially true in, um, in many of the communities where this type of overwrought police response is most criticized. Hmm. Let's change gears. I think that we covered, uh, you know, what we could on that without adding a whole nother element. You think our judicial system is the best in the world. It's yeah. better than Iran's. It's better than... Uh... <laughs> I'm just, I'll safely say it's better than Iran's judicial system. Nobody's Never being hung that. in the square <laughs> from a crane. It's the last time I checked. Mm -hmm. you know? but it, but, so our founders based our, our laws on old English law, right? Common law. And, and they did, what are we doing different than 
those in Europe, then those in England, then the, the people that we broke ties with? Yeah. What did we make better? So um, we've made a lot of stuff better. I mean, the law that we inherited it was basically 18th century common law, which is, which is one of the founding um, tenets or bedrocks of our, our criminal justice system. But of course, we adjusted that, um, obviously, with um, all of the wonderful things that were said in the Declaration of Independence, as well as all of the rights that were enshrined to us in our Constitution, and then making sure that all of our statutes can be balanced and consistent with the Constitution and all of the wonderful principles that are in there. So many of the statutes, by virtue of the fact that they have to comply with the Constitution themselves, are imbued with many of um, the wonderful rights and the the um, the the uh, preternatural wisdom that's in preternatural uh, in our Listen criminal up, justice guys. or the prodigious, I should get say, your, wisdom. Get the your great dictionary. The, when you're talking out. about the Constitution, you have to use big flowery words, or else you don't sound like right you here. fully and sufficiently appreciate it. Yeah, exactly. Read, read up on but, that. But um, no, the I mean the um, the what I think a lot of people don't realize about the criminal justice system is that it's the most disaggregated form of government that we have. Um, so what I mean by that is the criminal justice system in McHenry County is not the same as the criminal justice system in Cook County. It's certainly not the same as the justice system in Ferguson, Missouri, and it's certainly not the same as the justice system in Minneapolis, okay? It's a totally separate thing, and it's all under local control, okay? So I prosecute the crimes in McHenry County. I'm elected. If you don't like me, you, I can be voted out. There's a chief judge who is also elected who runs the entire court system. There's a sheriff who dispenses laws who is also elected locally, mm -hmm. right? So all of the major actors who are responsible for how our criminal justice system is dispensed what is prosecuted, how it is prosecuted, what are the senses, it's all local. All of the police chiefs, they're hired by the mayor mm -hmm. who are directly responsible to a group of a thousand people. All right. So when people are saying, oh, well, the United States has a mass incarceration problem, for example, um, you got to be more specific. Who has a mass incarceration problem? McHenry County doesn't have a mass incarceration problem. We imprison about 99 per every 100,000 residents that we have, which is on par with many of the European countries, France and Germany and England. It's less than England, which, hold, which we hold out for having these moderate and sensible um, sentencing laws. I want to make sure people are tracking here. You're suggesting, so we've got this theory that I hear constantly, we've got a mass incarceration problem in America, there's people being locked up. Uh, many people bring up the privatization of jails and prisons as part of the problem, and then those people, I mean, I'm sure you have, you probably have these private prison people coming to you saying lock people up and we'll give you a little, give you a boat. There's no private boat. prisons in Illinois. Okay, okay, you okay. Know? That's good um, to know. So, the, um, so no, and um, I, I, there's no joy that comes to me or a police officer or anybody in locking somebody up. And what I think our criminal justice system has evolved to, especially over the last 20 years when it comes to drug offenses, when it comes to um, when it comes to um, property offenses, um, is that w if people get every single opportunity to comport themselves to the eminently reasonable behavior of the law. So if you look at the Illinois Department, so we, so we imprison about 99 per 100,000. Okay, compare that to the country as a whole, which is 770 people per 100,000. But you have to remember, each individual county and district has its own criminal justice system. Chicago, it's about 530 per 100,000. So when people in Illinois say, hey, we have a mass incarceration problem, McHenry County doesn't, LaSalle County doesn't, um, uh, whatever county that down south doesn't, but Cook County has a mass incarceration problem. Correlation there too is Cook County has the highest crime rates of any sure and yeah. there's a correlation there as well yeah, which yeah, is yeah. they have the highest crime rate highest so it's murder kind of rate in the, the state. highest violent crime yeah. rate so if you look at the idoc statistics about 60 percent of the people there are for violent crime then you have another 20 percent who's there for property crime another 20 there for drug crime so everybody says oh well let's just legalize drug. well the people the people in the illinois department of corrections that are being imprisoned for drug crimes on average have 19 prior arrests Okay, so this is important to talk about. So there's not some kid getting busted with a joint in his never, pocket. Never, ever, never happened, never will happen. The criminal justice system does not have time for that. So the drug so offender in DOC. Not, there's not dudes going to jail because they had a couple hundred dollars of drugs on them? 
No. So you're saying I, I want to make sure that the uh, listeners unless are, they unless had, they have a unless they, their record is such and their criminal history is such where they have where they, where they have multiple if not dozens of prior arrests. I I cut you off, but where you were at is people in IDOC, Illinois Department of Corrections. You're not commenting on on Wisconsin or Ohio, but here, which is probably a pretty good cross section of the country because we have one of the biggest cities in the country and we're as rural as it gets to. 19 prior arrests for the incarcerated people there for drug charges. 19 prior arrests, six prior felony arrests, Jeez. six prior arrests for a violent crime. All right. So that's just drugs. It's worse when you're talking about property criminals. So we this we're, is so we're sending two people to prison. One is inveterate criminals. Okay. What was that word? Inve- people with horrible criminal histories. Okay. All right. What was the word? And the second inveterate. What does that mean? It means like, uh, in, like it means like a lot. Okay. okay. <laughs> All right. Uh, and then the um, or, or people that that are committed to being a criminal, mm-hmm. right? The second is, uh, yeah, write it down. Yeah, write it, write it down. Oh, yeah. And then the Keep second going. one is violent criminals, all right? Those are the two people that are in getting In the violent sent. ones, that could be one and done, right? You, it can be one and done. Sure. It can be one and done, depending on the nature of the crime. But for the most part, unless somebody is seriously, seriously injured or killed, um, you're not going to the Illinois Department of Correction. Inveterate that. adjective, having a particular habit, activity, or interest that is long established and unlikely to change. Hmm. It's I, appropriate use. Yeah, that's great. Um, so I'm an inveterate purveyor of dick jokes. Yeah. Well, you're. A, Did I use it correctly? <laughs> No, because Come I, on! I, 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 think you have a, I think you have a higher level of <laughs> comedy that, that I've at least seen. You know okay. what I mean? I, have a, I think I have a higher opinion of your own, okay. of your own wit than you Got do. Got you. Uh, but anyway, long and the short is, it's the, there's this, and this whole idea with marijuana, like, oh, uh, we're going to we'll legalize marijuana and they won't be sending people to prison for marijuana. I tell people, I say, here's the key to the McHenry County Jail. This was, this was two years ago before they passed the legalization. Go there and let everybody out there who's there solely on a marijuana-related offense. Nobody's getting let out, all right? And the people that were there rarely on one of these are trafficking in hundreds huge of huge amounts of-, of marijuana. Less than, prior to the legalization of marijuana, about 1% of the people in the Illinois Department of Corrections were there for marijuana-related offense, and again, I guarantee you, it was not the person who had uh, who had seventy ounces of weed in their freezer and who liked to smoke occasionally. It just never happened, you know. Um, why are people? I, I, why is the wrong word? Where is this narrative coming from? I mean, I guess it's the same one. It's, it's the same say, narrative man. that it's hard to say. Cops are all trying to kill yeah. people, or or all lawyers are. Scumbags. I think that's the most interesting question is like, what is like, if you, a lot of the critique of the criminal justice system doesn't necessarily hold up to scrutiny. And so then you have to ask yourself the question, okay, well, what is really going on here? And um, I don't know the answer fully to that. Like some of the ideas are that um, you have sort of like this postmodern critique that uh, and everybody is sort of looking at the world in like this Marxist way where it's all about power and it's all about control. And there's a lot of people who rightly are very skeptical of the criminal justice system and believe that it should be subject to a higher level of scrutiny by virtue of the fact that we're allowed to use force and we're allowed to imprison people. We have this huge effect on people's lives. There's also, I think, a reaction to the get tough on crime um, drug response that started in the 90s and then went up through the 2010s. Uh, I think th- I think rightly there's people that are critiquing um, the excessive levels of incarceration in the United States, especially in some counties and in some areas. I think that critique, again, is a little bit overcooked and overstated, um, but I think that it's still f- a fair debate and discussion, but when you're talking about things like to fund the police, when you're talking about things about fundamentally changing the nature of how we've been doing things, of how people for hundreds of years and all of that wisdom that's gone into the criminal justice system of some of the smartest people throughout history in creating what we have here, which is a pretty remarkable thing, um, when you just talk about dismantling that 
or raising it and starting again, I can guarantee you whatever we start again with is not going to be as good. Um, and many of the changes that we're making now, especially with, with bail reform and some of the stupidity that's coming. Talk about that out a little bit. But real quick, though, just to solidify your earlier point that I think people need to make sure that they they are grasping the fact that this is all local level thing. There's not some government agency in Washington telling you no. or, or Bill, our sheriff, or the chief judge how to dispense justice. That's this, right? The yeah. U.S. Constitution. That's the voters. That's the people that put us in place. And that's the part that I think people don't fully appreciate that on that local level, that's how important it is. Mm -hmm. Yes, you have your own opinions and worldviews and things of that nature, but if people don't like it, vote you out. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Vote, exactly. Vote and you out. you can see that the voting has huge consequences. Like compare what I'm doing to, let's say, Kim Fox mm -hmm. in Chicago. Which is we have the same job under the Constitution. How she does things in Cook County is vastly different from some of the things that I'm doing in McHenry County. And so that just goes to show you how a lot of these local elections and all the rest of it can have real significant consequences. So if you want to change the criminal justice system, like if you want to make it more just in a way that comports with whatever your ideas are, start at the local level. Mm -hmm. you know, that, that's really where you should start. And, um, and that's what I've always said about local government is that everybody spends all their time, whatever, clutching their pearls and um, 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 gnashing their teeth about whatever's going on in Washington, D.C., when all many of the decisions that are being made uh, that af truly affect your day-to-day -day are being made right on a local level. Yeah. But with regard to bail reform... I was about to bring that back So, um, okay, so they... Um, so this this is the law that they passed. Okay, here in Illinois, this is the law. That they but passed this is happening in, in other places. Yeah, it's happening in other places. It was a disaster in New York, and mm -hmm. they actually rescinded the law in the New York. They took a lot of what was in the New York law and they brought it here to Illinois. But okay, so so bail is an interesting thing, and it's a tough thing because you have you have somebody that's presumed innocent, right? Under our law, under our law, you're until... presumed innocent. Nobody's found you guilty beyond a reasonable doubt, but in order to arrest somebody, you have to have probable cause, which is a reasonable basis to believe that that person committed a crime. So it's like, all right, what do you do with this person? Like they may have committed a crime. They may be a danger to the community. Um, how are we going to ensure that they don't just abscond, take off, comply with the conditions of bond? And how do we ensure that this person who is still presumed innocent, if they are considered to be dangerous, what do we do with them? Can we incarcerate them pre-trial if we yeah, make it a determination. Is there enough evidence to keep them here? Right. Or yeah, right. I caught him with a bloody right. knife standing over the corpse. Exactly. Yeah. So For, it's a, a lot of it depends on the evidence and a lot of it depends on the nature of the crime and all the rest of it. But so there's like this weird tension there. Um, and so how they've normally done it throughout whatever, at least... For, for the last hundreds of years as they've come up with this idea of, well, they'll put down a cash surety, which is going to ensure that they'll lose if they do one of two things. One is like commit another crime and two is not comply with the conditions of bond. Which so is show, up to, show up to court, show up to your trial date. Maybe if you're, maybe if you were um, uh, arrested for like a DUI or a drug related offense, not use drugs, not drive under, or not use alcohol, whatever the case may be. There's a, there's certain things, or if you're arrested for a domestic battery, not have contact with the victim, things like that. Those are some of the conditions of bond, and we want to ensure that you're going to comply with them. So, um, so there's like, a, so, okay, so people are saying, well, it seems really unfair that rich people um, then uh, are allowed that rich people who are who can pay this money are then allowed to go out where more impoverished people who may not be allowed to pay well they seem to just have to sit in jail because committing not, the same offense right so that's not entirely true and if you look at the McHenry if you look at McHenry County prior to bail reform about ninety five percent of the people that are arrested get out of jail all right so if you've committed an offense let's say that you are a, um, a, a that you stole four loaves of bread to feed your children, and you don't necessarily have a criminal history. What is that? Say miserable. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. But seriously, like, but that, but that's, but the, these are the stories mm -hmm. that are being told. Mm -hmm. You know that that these are the stories that are being told, which create this impression that the criminal justice system is X. We got to tell another story. That person is getting an I bond, which means that they're released on their own signature. 
10 times out of 10 every day of the week and five times on Sunday. Like that person is never being held, all right? The, what generally happens is a judge will say, how much can you pay in bail? And the person will say, well, I can pay $200. And if the judge wants to release him, he'll reset the bail to $200. If the judge wants to hold them, they'll set the bail at $1,000. Based $1, on the totality of the circumstances. Based on the totality of the circumstances. And, and they were already required to take a person's ability to pay into... Um, if if right. your guy stands up and says, Judge, right. we have a right something to talk about here. There's video footage of this right. guy kicking a dude in the head. Right. Yeah, yeah. That's now the most just way to do it is probably how the feds do it. They have a hold no hold system. So they'll just make a determination. Are we going to hold this guy or are we not going to hold this guy based on the, what we project is their danger to the community. That comes down to good people analyzing the data. You look at all the data and there's a, there's all of these tools. There's, a, there's all of these tools that you can use and these systems and evidence-based um, th things that you can use in order to make these risk assessments. And then you look at their criminal history and you look at, well, did, the last time that they were in custody, did Has they comply with the conditions there never been bail on a federal bond, level? Or, I don't know. I don't know how long that's been in place, but that's what it is now. So it's sort of a hold no hold system. All right. So what the but what Illinois did is they basically said everybody's getting out. All right. So we so they basically relinquished the ability of the Illinois courts to hold people, and this is how they've done this. All right. Is this taking effect yet? Twenty twenty three. Okay. So what so what what ultimately they're going to do is so so unless you face a crime where the only punishment is the Illinois Department of Corrections. Okay, so and then some felon. other offenses, some other type of offense, but generally like class X, class M, which is murder. Unless you face one of those penalties, you cannot, you, we have to release you. So basically now you're just processing paperwork. Processing paperwork. Bring them in, take a picture, let them go. But worse is I, this, I, it's my fourth DUI, okay? And I go up in front of the judge, I've just been arrested. I say, judge, I love drinking and driving. <laughs> okay. I'm not going to stop drinking and driving. There's nothing you can do or tell me that's going to make me stop drinking and driving. And I don't care if I kill somebody. No choice. Got to let them go. Okay. Now, let's say you're charged with one of those offenses where, the where you only face a DOC sentence. We can only hold you if you are a specific, if we can prove the first day you show up in court that you're a specific identifiable, that you're a specific risk to an identifiable person. Okay, think about so, that first. So, so Mickey is a risk to Bob over here and here's why. Right, but let's say that I'm, let's say that, that you're Mickey and you've killed Bob. And the only evidence we have of animus that you have towards anybody is your animus to Bob. Bob's dead. What specific identifiable person do you pose a risk to? None. None. There's the door. Already got him. <laughs> you already got him. <laughs> You're out the door. Or let's say, they, again, go back to the drunk driver. Like, yeah, it's, my, it's a class X felony. Sure, it's my eighth time. Now I only face DOC. But judge, yes, I'm going to drink and drive. And yes, I'm going to go out there. But how many people die from drunk driving every year? Do you know? A lot. Numbers? I don't know exactly. Off the thousands? Top of my head. No, not thousands. No. Not thousands. Hundreds? I, like I said, it's it's a lot. It's m far more than it should be. But that would be a I'm good thing look to look up. up. You can look that up on the Secretary of State's. So it's just nuts. Now, whether or not there's trailer bills that are going to come along and fix this is, um, is, is, you know, I guess we'll have to see. But this, but th this is what they did. They, they, they rammed this legislation through during lame duck session, and uh, it's a catastrophe. One person every 50 minutes. In the United States? 29 people per day. How many in Illinois? I'm looking. Dang. Every day, about 28 people in the U.S. die in a dunk, drunk driving crash. That's one person every 52 minutes. In 2019, these deaths reached the lowest since 82. Due to 19, 10,142 people died in alcohol-related car crashes. Mm -hmm. That's crazy. Let's see the Illinois number. That's nuts. But so. now you're imagine. But now imagine that that's your loved one sure. who was killed. All right, and now you know what I mean. I had a school teacher who lost both her daughters to right. a drunk driver. Right, and so the, like what the criminal ju it just continues to make this mistake, and then it corrects, and then it continues to make this mistake, which is the criminal justice system, and it should be. And I'm not saying that it's not, but it's obsessed very oftentimes with the 
inordinary or the not ordinary right. So they're obsessed with rights that go beyond right to defend yourself, right to an attorney, right to uh, have your be secure in their property and things, right to question witnesses against you, right to participate in your own defense. Like those are the ordinary rights. It's obsessed with these inordinary rights of defendants and, it, and that's kind of where we are right now and what gets lost every single time in the shuffle is the rights of victims mm -hmm. and how traumatic these things are and how these how these i mean if anybody's been a victim of a crime they know what i'm talking about it's like an empty lonely feeling and if you've lost somebody that's been killed um it, it's it's it it's it, it has these ramifications that can like echo down through generations mm -hmm. you know it's this trauma that people uh, that people live with for their whole life but that also affects other people around them and that other people can inherit um, and it's and it it's it's always overlooked and it's always undervalued hmm. always in the protection of one's right to be a criminal yeah it, it within the criminal justice system mm -hmm. you know and I mean, we are innocent until, pr until proven guilty, and now with the way that things are reported, the body cam footage being released, nobody has a fair trial anymore. Let me rephrase that. Yeah, you these, can, sens you to, these sensationalized uh, cases, the public has already weighed and measured these people, like Chauvin, and I, I'm not, I don't know all the facts, I don't, even, I'm just using it as an example, the amount of information that was uh, broadcast through the internet for a year before the guy ever walked into a courtroom. Everybody's got an opinion. It's already done. Yeah. So especially on like high profile cases, I mean, th I, I, there's a lot of pressure brought to bear. Now, I, uh, after looking at the law in Minnesota, I fully agree with that verdict. I think it was the right verdict. But you also do have to question whether or not there were some due process irregularities as it comes to Derek Chauvin. So the whole idea that these jurors um, were sort of aware or couldn't help but be aware, and whether or not they were, I don't know. Maybe that was part of the process of screening them or not. But this whole idea that unless a certain verdict is reached, uh, there's going to be a fire that's going that there's going to be significant property destruction mm -hmm. um, significant civil unrest um, you know whether or not th th that influence the jurors is unknowable in my opinion it doesn't matter because I think they clearly reach the right verdict but it's st it's still cre in, in less clear cases y you wonder and then you but, but one of the things that's problematic about that is that you're jeopardizing that conviction so like Justice was done for George Floyd, okay? But now the so but now Derek Chauvin's defense team has all kinds of great arguments that they can make to the appellate court with respect to everything that was going on and everything that went into this trial that may have improperly impacted the jurors and then it gets reversed. All right, and now we got to do it all over again. And whether or not that's prudent, and whether or not culturally, um, in terms of the media, we should maybe take some steps to turn the volume down on some of this stuff. I think is an important discussion it's because we have this weird sense of having the right to know everything too. Yeah. Now I have a right to know what the temperature <laughs> yeah. is in Phoenix at eight o'clock tomorrow morning. Well, I get anxious. Like I'll think of something I want to know. And if I can't immediately get it, it, it creates <laughs> I, anxiety. I, it creates like a problem for right, you know I, what I, I mean? Muscle, muscle. <laughs> right. Now, now like, like when I did not, I'll be like, like I'll want to know something. And then I'll say to myself, no, but you look at your cell phone too much. So you're not going to do it. It creates stress. Yeah, it <laughs> creates like stress for me. <laughs> <laughs> so here's the other side of this, though. We must have reform at various points. I'm glad my wife and my daughter and your wife and my granddaughter get to vote. I'm glad black people can't be owned anymore. I'm glad that gay people get to live as they want to. Uh, I'm glad that I can worship your God or mine or his. So we have reform in law that has to take place. And there's some, still some crazy... Uh, morally based laws that are on the book, like can't have butt sex, go to jail. I mean, just crazy stuff like that that's based on, on somebody's religious beliefs, deep-held religious convictions. What does need to change? 
I mean, because there's there's definitely places in the country, you and I talked about it, where there's good old boy stuff. Sheriff, state's attorney, and deputies are out there running running roadblocks on people passing through, collecting fees, really just extorting and shaking people down. It smells like weed in here. There's no weed in this car. Well, here's a ticket. You know, show up to court, which is a thousand miles from home, yeah. or just pay the five hundred dollar fine. Yeah. And like that crap happens all the time. I think body cameras is a huge part of it. You do? I do. I think body cams is a huge, huge part of um, what the future of policing ultimately is going to be. So in Illinois, they, they passed that law. And one of the good things that was in that law is that they're requiring every single department in Illinois to have body cams. And when you so have- so much money to the public though. It's, I mean, yeah, but you got, I, I think a lot of those, I, I think there's this demand, I think a lot of, there's going to be enough competition, I think a lot of the cost, and I, it's worth it. Like, um, t when, it's at least for the prosecution, like, having a police officer come up and try, and try to verbalize and articulate um, the, the pain and the um, desperation and the panic in the voice of a domestic battery victim that comes running out of the house to get, as opposed to seeing that with the, the visual image, um, you know, I, I, th I think it's, I, it's worth every penny. And I think that much of, um, um, I think that if it is a question, let's say, of police misconduct, okay? Um, sunlight is the best remedy for that kind of thing. And having a seeing eye on a, on a bad police officer's chest is going to inhibit a lot of the misconduct, if not all of the misconduct that a police mm -hmm. officer is going to, um, is going to engage in. Um, the, the court system is, um, it provides ample opportunity where if a person really feels as though they were wrong, by misconduct, provides ample opportunity through motions to suppress, through motions to quash arrest, through things of that nature, to have these hearings on whether or not, A, there was police misconduct and the person can get up there and give their side of the story. Now, things are not what they used to be um, in terms of uh, people's impression of what a police officer is saying to them. I mean, it kind of used to be police officers up there, their word is oak, can't dispute it. Now, if you look at like public opinion polls, whether or not people believe, like 50% of the public believes police officers, 50% of the public is going to be skeptical in terms of what a police officer says. Mm -hmm. So just to suggest that a police officer can just say, hey, I found this in the car and, uh, oh, look at this, a little bit of cocaine in your car. We're going to put this in an evidence, but, you know, pull this it out of the This is valid from the perspective of a jury. Yeah, it's valid from the perspective of a jury, but I also think, especially with a judge as well, you know, a judge is, a judge who is around police officer, who's around defendants, probably probably has uh, one of the, is, is well schooled in sorting through and teasing out these issues, especially when it comes to credibility and things like that. And I can assure you in a place like McHenry County, if there's somebody that is, uh, if there's a police officer that is, let's say, beating confessions out of somebody, or if there's a police officer that is tampering with or planting evidence, that police officer will have a reputation you know, and judges know the police officers in McHenry County. They know their reputations, and that's all stuff that gets, that uh, I think ultimately is things that get factored in. Um, but in terms of like what needs to be done, I think we need to, th like when it comes to the, the t people dying after they're restrained can't happen. Like it just can't happen, you know what I mean? It's one thing, spur to the moment, uh, it, is it a gun? Is it not a gun? Like we, we, that, that we can talk about. But when you have somebody restrained and in handcuffs, we got to figure out a way where either there's a quicker paramedic response, or whether the police have certain par or whether police have certain training where people are not dying. I mean, and it's not just George Floyd. It's Tony Timpa. It was the it's the guy in Chicago from. Um, the, the day after uh, the George Floyd verdict. You know, there's people who are restrained in cuffs who for whatever reason are, um, are, 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 are dying from these um, positional like cardiac, positional, those types of arrests. And like, you just can't have it. And, but again, it's not as simple as like, you just can't have it, there's gotta be training. Again, like the, the circumstances are so there, fraught, like because people are, are intense and they're it, like you're having an encounter with police, your heart is pumping, mm -hmm. you know, like you're on, you're being restrained, excited you just had delirium. a fight, it's like you're mm -hmm. excited, whatever, like these are exactly the type of circumstances um, that, um, that create 
bad things happening, which again, and w which it goes back just to kind of close the loop, it goes back to what we were talking about before about just how difficult it is for police to really restrain somebody if they don't want to restrain. It just really underscores the cultural messaging that we need to put out there not to resist the police. Just cooperate with the police. Don't resist the police. There will be plenty of opportunity if you suffered some type of injustice at the hands of the police to vent that and for that all to um, come out. I like that. I mean, that's how we talk to people. But the problem, I think, for a lot of folks is that when you take uh, these situations where somebody is unjustly detained, uh, it's easy for those of us that have a halfway decent income to say, okay, I'll hire a lawyer, toss a couple bucks at him, get him to go argue my case. But if you're a person that's on a fixed income, it's hard to pay rent. This concept of I'll get a lawyer to seek justice after some injustice is placed upon me. I mean, that's huge. So a lot of that is, so much of where that is ultimately going to be, um, um, of, of where that ultimately is going to come to light and be deliberated on is going to be in your criminal case, all right? Everybody's entitled to a public defender. Everybody. Everybody's entitled to legal representation. Public defenders are well equipped at, at, um, at, at fighting for these types of things, um, of uh, filing the appropriate motions, and everybody thinks to themselves, oh, like, you're gonna get a public defender. There's all kinds of studies out there that show that public defenders are just as effective as private lawyers in terms of pretrial motions, in terms of negotiated plea, in terms of trial outcomes, if not better, and especially in Philadelphia. And it makes sense, right? Because they got home court advantage. They know the judge who they're in front of. They know what the judge could, finds convincing. They have the best relationships with the prosecutors in, in the courthouse, and they have the most experience. This is all they do is criminal law, and all they do is file these types of motions and litigate these kinds of cases day in and day out. And very oftentimes, they're, they're some of the best attorneys in a courthouse, whether it comes to private attorneys, state's attorneys, or otherwise. Hmm. Interesting. That was a good argument, Counselor. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. But all that being said, though, you know that, that, that the... The pain point is what always gets the attention, right? And that's what people are focusing on. This, us Americans have this special concept of not being with, and other people in the world are okay with it. Like I've got friends in Canada that yeah. are quite all right with a level of that nobody here would allow, nobody here would suggest is okay. Yeah. But up there, they're like, well, you know, it's just like, uh, you know, parliament, yeah. we still got the queen on our money, you know, like, <laughs> you know, let's go fishing. Like that, to them, is completely normal where we look at these things. It's, I feel like it's bred into us, you yeah. know, to push back in, in, in uh, the whiskey rebellion, right? Uh, you know, you're not going to tax us because we want to make booze. As far back as the beginning of our of our young republic, we were pushing back from, from government. Like yeah. there, there has to be a point, like a fine line where we still can have this frontier spirit, which some people are not okay with. Some people want to take us to this socialist, you know, new world order business, but there's still plenty of us that are like, I'm gonna go split some trees in the backyard with an ax and you can kiss off. I, I think it's good though. I mean, when you, if you're talking about a healthy skepticism for authority, especially when you're talking about the authority, when you're talking about the police and prosecutors, which have the power to take away your life and liberty, like that is a good, healthy thing. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, the question ultimately is how that is, um, how that is ultimately expressed, mm -hmm. you know? And um, the, the the, the 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 one point I'll make, like, you want to, like, talk shit. You know what I mean? Like, you want to insult a police officer. Like, you want to tell them that they're jackboots or whatever. Like, fine. Just don't fight them. Just don't get into a physical and conversation I'm not suggesting with the police officer. people should do that, because... If I go get a cup of coffee and the gal at the counter is not going fast enough, me being rude to her is not going to increase right. anything for me other than getting spit in my no, coffee. No, but then if the idea is like you don't, and then you want to say, but this was an unlawful arrest, and you want to file a motion to call, and you want to say, I, I'm not, I'm not guilty, and I want my day in court, like all of that stuff, all, all of that individualism, all of that, um, all of that. Uh, 
resistance, for, for lack of a better word, just maybe reflexively to having authority come down in your life. There's all kinds of opportunities. Mm -hmm. But again, the, the, the restrictions that we as a society have put on our citizens, okay, are reasonable. They're not unreasonable. All right. Can you think of any unreasonable restrictions? I think we have some unreasonable gun laws here in Illinois. I mean, right now, Floyd card. Criminal. That, that's what okay, I'll say. Criminal. So the, in terms of the criminal restrictions, okay. like what we're asking you to do to not be charged right. don't, criminally. Don't, don't break into your neighbor's house and steal, steal his wife's right. jewelry. Right. Don't, don't shoot somebody. Right. It's pretty, there's a lot of room Unlawfully. to be, uh, you know, there's a lot of room to be like an iconoclast between like, you know, criminal behavior and not. Like there's plenty of room to, to do your thing, be your individual, not like authority, all the rest of it. The, what, the, the, what we're just asking you to do is the most basic stuff of a civil society. The, what we're asking you to do to stay out of criminal court is literally the least you can do. Right. Okay, because you can be a pretty shitty human and not be yeah, a criminal. of course. Yeah, you can be kind of like a grumpy piece of garbage, right. but not be found a criminal. Right. And that's the Bill of Rights protects us and to be a grumpy... Right. Jag off. Right. And that's like a lot of times when there's a when there's a conflict between um, maybe a police officer who is that and when it becomes problematic for the police officer is uh, is there's a punitive response to somebody being a jerk, you know, and what I think most police officers know and what they understand, and what they deal with every single day mm -hmm. are people being complete jerks, mm -hmm. but not necessarily criminals. And I think that's, that's a, where restraint comes in. That's a great point that I talk with police friends a lot about it. And I think the general public, myself included, need to be reminded of that. Everybody that that person interacts with is having the worst day. Yeah. Somebody died. They got, they committed a criminal act. Mm -hmm. They've got a uh, anxiety attack, whatever. But then on the other hand, I, and this is something none of us would do, you call customer service somewhere and that, that person on the other end of the phone is treating you like shit because they've had a bad day. What's the first thing we think of? That's not my problem. I need you to help me. Right. So police officers who are choosing to do that job, while we need to remember that they're dealing with shit all day, they need to remember each customer, each citizen that they interact with. I had nothing to do with what you did all day mm -hmm. yesterday. I mm -hmm. had nothing to do with what you argued with your wife about. I had nothing to do with, I think that's just being an adult, but that's a cop out, excuse me, for a lot of humans, not just in law enforcement, like I've had a bad day as such, I'm gonna be a dick. I know, but they are humans, you know what I mean? And I know you percent. know, and I know that, I know that's not, and uh, I mean, I just think that, um, I think we need to, when we're interacting with the police, like you said, they're dealing with the worst of humanity mm -hmm. on a daily basis. They're dealing with people who are having their worst days and as well as the biggest jerks, if not criminals, among us every single day. And that's primarily who they focus on. And to pretend that that doesn't have an effect on you is, I think, um, I think for not non non-criminal people, which is all of our listeners and viewers, if you're a non-criminal person and you have a, what you feel to be as an improper or, or you're being contacted by law enforcement for some reason, traffic stop or whatever, just be sweet as pie. And I have cameras in our vehicles. Yeah. I have 360 cameras. I mean, they're cheap. You can buy a 360, 1080 four, or 4K camera that like it, I don't, I have it because I drive so much. I like see a car accident or something, <laughs> but, or, or if somebody hits me, just so I have like proof for insurance stuff. I drive so much, but it picks up both side windows too. If I have an interaction like that and somebody's inappropriate, well, okay, let's roll tape. Yeah, you know, let's talk about. This. And it's not. It's not even. It's not even like. Um, and it's also not just understanding police officers better. I think that there's like a disconnect between where police officers are coming and where the the public is coming. So I just think there's a lack of understanding sometimes, but it's also a lack of gratitude for the job that police officers do, I would which I think that. is like endemic at endemic levels. So wait, do within. you mean telling them I pay your salary? No, <laughs> what I mean is, think about it this way, okay? In the lived experience of humanity, okay, there has never been a time, or with, except within the last, like, let's say 30, 40 years, when you can call a group of people who will within minutes respond to the most hideous, 
maniacal, horrific danger uh -huh. while you run away. Mm -hmm. And they will do it for you. Over and over. Over and over again, you know? Um, and so it, and so, and if that doesn't stir at least some type of gratitude in you, you know, and like, yes, they're I, getting I paid, but I think, I think this is a good thing to talk about. There's other jobs where they could get paid. There's a, they could do there's it. a toll beyond the eight or 12 hour shift that some of the highest suicide rates, yeah. some of the highest alcoholism rates, some of the highest rates of heart disease and diabetes as a profession because the lack of sleep, the mm -hmm. constant stress levels, the jacked up cortisol yeah. and, and adrenaline levels yeah. at a constant, uh, and that's not something, you don't like get used to that. So then these guys or gals die young after, yes, they made a living, but they lived a 65 or 70. And if, if anything, what's going on like in, ter in terms of police officers leaving the force now, it just goes to prove that they're not just doing it for a job and they're not just doing it for a paycheck. They're doing it because they care and because they want to take care of their community. Um, there's plenty of other ways to go and make a living mm -hmm. in this world other than being a police officer. And as you've seen by the vast exit of a number of police officers who are not at retirement age, they're saying, I'm going to avail myself of those opportunities because it's just become too toxic and too difficult to, mm -hmm. do, to do police work right now. What would you change about criminal justice on a national level if you just had a magic wand? It can go. You get one thing, you could just change. Immediately? Sure, you could change it tomorrow. It would be law across the country. Um, Ho-hos at every arrest. Everybody gets a ho-ho, makes you happy. No, not the ho-hos. No, I think what I would do is I think I would find... Um, some way, and it's tricky, but... Don't and, worry about and, how. What would the end result be? So the end result Magic. would be some type of system where very early on in a case, where you, there's like a diversionary system. So very early on in a case, if you're willing to take responsibility and take accountability for what you did, mm -hmm. all right, then you go down this pathway and the case gets resolved that way. Whereas, and then w with all the other cases, they would probably go through the traditional criminal justice system. But just a way for, for those people who um, are sorry about what they did and to regret what they did and who understand the um, gravity of what they did and how it has affected not only the community but also individuals, uh, they might be able to be diverted into um, you know a, a, a type of uh, program or response that uh, perhaps doesn't have um, the severity in terms of the penalties that criminal they face. But it's tricky and it's hard because then you're kind of like, well, then people are just going to pretend to be unhappy. And now if you're going to give them lesser penalties, well, then you're depriving their right to trial because now they'll be incentivized to do. So it's, it's a real trick. So I don't quite know how you would ultimately do it. Um, but um, but some type of some type of system like that because really um, it, it, in my experience the mo the people who are most dangerous very oftentimes are those who don't recognize the wrongdoing of their conduct and mm. have no intention of changing and as a result of the fact that they don't recognize their conduct are doing everything in their power to avoid any type of consequences for it. All right, you're president. You've got an executive order on your desk. You can do anything and it's an executive order that nobody can change, what would it be? It doesn't have to do with law. Carbon taxes. Hmm. Talk about that. I'm an environmentalist. Like, I, I think... You just lost I, half our viewers. I know, you I just know. lost half our viewers. I know. But go ahead. They're going to come at me, but uh, I'm sure. But I, I, we, I think the carbon taxes is the most practical. I think you set a limit of carbon that the United States, that's in keeping with... Uh, ultimately, uh, that is in keeping ultimately with um, not exacerbating the problem of global warming, and the, 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 that's it. You know, you, you can either do it in terms of like carbon taxes, you can do it in your selling amounts of carbon that, sure. that can be emitted. I think that I think that global warming is uh, something that is. Um, one of the th most important things that we need to address right now as a generation. Um, and um, I think that's the way to do it. I think things like the Green New Deal or things where, uh, you know, you're going to be trying to um, terraform this new type of society from D.C. out, I think is problematic. I think if you if you 
monetize carbon and you put it into our capitalist system, I think you'll find a way to make it work. And I think people will make it work. There's some shitty science there, but after, I think I don't think anybody can travel around or just look at a map of uh, the United States or the world lit up at night. We consume so much fuel. Especially in the first world, like it's crazy. Just to, li just to live the lifestyle. We, I mean, the room that we're in right now, you guys don't see this, but there is four huge lights around us. There's three cameras rolling. Of course, we've got a climate controlled space. It, we wash our clothes yeah. and you know, dry clean this. Yeah, this is, I bought, you, this is Amazon, you know, like you got Yeah, it. and we all do it. I think the amount that we consume is crazy. Yeah, we, but everybody's like, yeah, that's great. Hey, you want to go get a steak? <laughs> nobody, nobody, nobody really wants to make big changes. We live in homes that are. Well, ginormous. you can diffuse responsibility. You know what I mean? And that's everybody's like, oh, well, we'll just sell smaller cars. It's like, yeah, but people don't want to buy. I don't think there's a solution to that. The solution, it's cultural. We've gotten, we love, I want to jump on an airplane, fly to the beach. No, I know, but I don't think, I don't think that, I don't think you can make a, sol the solution cannot be, hey, be conscious of it and be aware of, cause it's the exact same thing like you just said. So like spreading awareness and like that is not the solution. That's, that's not what I'm saying. Yeah, no, I know uh, that's yeah. not, but I'm just, that seems to be what everybody keeps saying. Like, oh, the solution but is that just. that person needs to now like be kind. Well, yeah, literally yeah, go like be I kind. Got it, saying right? that, but sure. that's different than living that way. Yeah, you don't, you don't know my mother-in-law. <laughs> you know <what> I mean? <laughs> no, I'm just I'm kidding. sending this if to no, you. No, 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 no. But that, no. that, that, that Joanne, she, I have a wonderful. Mother but that, but that is, I think, the challenge with all of this stuff. The even look back to the whole conversation we've had, or even a broader sense of the question. The thing that I think our thrust with this program, the higher line, and in like what we do at Carry Trainer. Yes, we teach people to shoot guns and all that stuff, but it's like, be a better citizen. Like, and what does that mean? It doesn't just mean like, I am a better citizen. Like, you get involved in electing yeah. better people in your community. And if you don't like it, don't call it a conspiracy. The conspiracy is you're too lazy to go pound signs in the ground to help Jill or Bob that are running for the office. Yeah. Or you don't know who, go talk to the people and say, I mean, I, you and I've had this discussion a thousand times, but I've talked to candidates like, well, how do you feel about this? And you get some BS softball response, like, sorry, dude, that it, or dude, that, that ain't it. You know, like, what will you do in this capacity? We need to hold people to that. Yeah. It, not just in, in uh, uh, police reform or gun reform, but if environmentalism is your thing, hippie. Um, personally, I'm going to be on a beach somewhere with a bonfire of tires <laughs> with, yeah. a, with, a, with an endangered parrot on a spit <laughs> smoking, a, smoking a cigarette. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I think uh, it's tragic what we, it, it's all pretty directly related to how much we consume and what we expect to be uh, comfortable. Yeah, and all of this stuff boils down to like, um, like whatever, all of like everything you talk about, you know, like police misconduct and all the rest of that stuff. Like we all sort of like know, right? Like inherently what is like the right thing to do, right? Like, unless you're a sociopath. Unless you're a sociopath, yeah, right? Yeah. But you all like basic, and the, the fact of the matter is, and this is like whatever, like this will take you back to Genesis, but like the fact of the matter is we just don't always do it. Do the right thing. You know? Mm -hmm. And so, and the fact of the matter is that that is going to be with us always, you know? Making wrong choices uh, in light of knowing and, the correct And path. a lot of, and trying to like correct for that and make things perfect or make, you know, usually causes more problems than it helps. Hmm. You know? If the people listening never get a chance to run into you, they don't get to shake your hand, see you on the jujitsu mat or out at the dance club. He's a very well, well learned salsa dancer. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> he's got no moves. His hips are his hips are like That's a, a mood. What are you talking about? <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> what would you leave him with? Um, I'd leave him. Um, I don't know. I guess I'd I'd leave him with. Um, the most important thing in life is your family. That's yeah. it. You know, I got four little boys and um, uh, all the rest of it is just, um, is fluff, you know? And so that's, that's, that's what I'm coming to realize in all of my, all of the aspirations and all of your ambitions and all of these ideas and talking about it and all the rest of it. Like, 
um, um, like a, all this stuff, you know, like that we consume ourselves with in terms of like, I'm mad about this, or I believe this, or I think that, and it all is just exists in like this abstract. Nothing compares to just like the tangible reality of being like a good father and a good husband, taking care of your family, and then the people that are are closest to you. And uh, uh, half of everything that everybody's doing in terms of like thinking that their opinion on national politics or otherwise has some type of meaning or whatever is just pure narcissism. A lot of narcissists these days. Yeah. We've bred a society where we feel we have we have the right to an opinion, but we feel our opinion is somehow supersedes everybody else's. Yeah, or, like, or you don't have a healthy skepticism to your opinion. Like the stuff, uh, everything I've said today, like I'm open to changing my mind about. I, I totally am. You know, um, there's there's nothing that I'm like firmly attached to, especially when you're talking about things that affect government and human affairs. Like nothing. Tell me a better way or. A different way. Yeah, and, yeah let's if I'm wrong, I'm wrong. Like, let's talk about it. That's a big challenge I think we all have now. I go through Facebook. You know, we all use these applications. You probably not as much as others. But for us, it's it's a business-related thing. But I have Facebook. It's family. But then there's other people. And you scroll through there and you look at folks that you kind of, birds of a feather, and you can look at somebody's thing and go, okay, this guy will laugh when he hears Pat say carbon credits. <laughs> He'll be mad at Mickey because he <laughs> yeah. said gay rights. You know, and it's like, can we not accept each other uh, having disagreements and yeah. not seeing the world exact, how boring the place would be if we all saw the world exactly the same way. Yeah, and how uh, clenched the world is when we all take it so freaking seriously. Yeah. I mean, there's definitely right and wrong, which I know you agree with. We can't just, we can't tear our streets apart because we're upset and, and we have our own opinions of right and wrong. Uh, I've got friends in Portland that have been living in hell for the last year with the city on yeah. fire. Uh, you can't just do that. In, and that's completely subjecting everybody else to misery because you don't have a way to voice your concerns or opinion. Like that kind of stuff, of course, doesn't work. Hey, I hope you guys enjoyed this conversation. We'll end it here. If you have a guy like Pat or a gal like Pat, came out wrong, in your community that's in office, help them stay there. If there's somebody that is in your community that's running for office like this, and these offices are so important because at a local level, these are the people that, that as he eloquently explained to you all, direct the outcome of, of really the culture of your community on a criminal justice level, but the same with the people that run your roads, the people that run your schools, that's all, that's all up to you. And you might say, I just have one vote, but if you're willing to put the work in, like the 56 dudes that signed our declaration, then you too can help guys like that or yourself get elected and then you make change. It's not just about talking or thinking, it's about doing. So I hope you share this with somebody. Hey, you, you've been in here twice now. You gotta sign our, our, our wall again. Somewhere new. It'd be oh, right back here. over it? Yeah, okay. No, somewhere new. You can kick that chair out of the way too if you need to. I appreciate you. Thank you. Yeah. We'll talk offline about those carbon credits. <laughs> <laughs> oh, here I am. Yeah. I'll go again. I'll there go you there. go, I'll go again. If you guys enjoyed the podcast, share it. Put some comments if there's stuff What's that, the date? that today is the 29. If there's stuff that you didn't agree with, that's cool as we talked about. Put it in the comment section. Let's have some con conversation about it. Talk about the what, the why, the where, the how, and see how we can come to common ground. Be well, don't be dickheads. Hey, tell Drew how much you appreciate his videography and editing skills. He works harder than all of us. Peace out, don't be dickheads. Visit our website, kerrytrainer.com, for information about classes held throughout the U.S., Kerry Trainer Apparel, and upcoming projects. You can also email us at training at kerrytrainer.com for information about setting up your own private course or speaking engagement. Training at kerrytrainer.com or kerrytrainer.com. Hey, Steve, what do you think of gunfighter gun oil? Well, Mick, I have to show you about that. Gunfighter, gunfighter lube. Baby, I had the gun.
gunfighter, gunfighter blue. But then I got me some gunfighter, gunfighter lube. Let me tell you about it. I'm made in the USA. Amazing lubricity. Amazing adhesion, baby. A hundred percent synthetic. But it's gonna last ya. Gunfighter, gunfighter, gun old baby. Took away my gunfighter blue. I'm still working on it, but you. Oh, yeah. So you like the lube? 